Good day and welcome to the Blood Cancers and CAR T Cellular Therapy, a discussion with Dr. Sergio Geralt conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ms. Jennifer Gillette. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much, Erin. Yes, my name is Jennifer Gillette, and I'm the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. I'd like to welcome everyone on the call today. This month's program will focus on blood cancers in honor of Blood Cancer Awareness Month, and we will also discuss CAR T cell therapy. It's our goal that today's program will inspire you and equip you with a new skill or idea as you uh, learn how to go through this journey. A special thank you to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and our link partners for making this program possible today. Just so everyone knows how our uh, program is going to run today, we'll have a few minutes of introduction, uh, and then we will have Dr. Sergio uh, speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we have a survivor, J.C. Walsh, uh, who will be speaking. Um, she is a CAR-T uh, client who received that therapy. Uh, then we are going to open the floor for questions and comments, and then we'll wrap up with a couple resources at the end. For those who may not be familiar with the link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We provide resources, support, and education. Some of the resources we provide to help families navigate their transplant journey are webinars, podcasts, blogs, and a lunch and learn calls for a variety of topics such as chronic graft-versus-host disease and specific cancer information. We also talk about caregiving, coping, treatment options, and survivorship after transplant. We have our peer support mentor program for patients, caregivers, and donors, our second birthdays recognition program. We have books, referrals, and we also provide emotional support from a licensed social worker. We provide a variety of other educational supportive opportunities, such as the call you are on today. Please feel free to reach out if you are interested in any of these services. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to review just a couple quick housekeeping items to maximize the experience of all on the call today. First of all, due to a limited amount of time, the facilitator will need to make sure each question or comment does not go longer than necessary. Please also only ask one question at a time. You can always get back in the line, and if there is time on the call, you can ask another one. Please know that the information provided in this program is meant to stimulate conversation with your own healthcare provider and is not meant to replace your individualized medical plan. Dr. Geralt, we are so honored to have him, but we know that he cannot individually answer all personal medical questions. So now on to our speakers. Uh, Sergio Geralt received his medical degree from uh, the University of Central de Venezuela. He completed his residency at Good Samaritan Hospital and his fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. In addition to his positions at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Dr. Geralt is a professor of medicine at Cornell Medical College and the Melvin Berlin Family Chair in Myeloma Research. Dr. Geralt is an active member of several professional societies. He previously served as a chairperson on the executive board of the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research and the steering committee of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network, and he is the past president of ASDMT. He is a board-certified hematologist-oncologist whose clinical practice and research focus on stem cell transplantation for patients with blood disorders. Dr. Geralt, with his colleagues, pioneered the use of reduced-intensity conditioning regimens for older or more debilitated, debilitated patients with blood cancers. Currently, Dr. Geralt's research is examining the use of T-cell depletion techniques to dramatically reduce the risk of graft-versus-host disease. He has published and presented extensively on these topics. Additionally, Dr. Geralt has served as the principal investigator for a number of clinical trials that examine new treatment approaches for multiple myeloma and the other blood cancers that aim to reduce symptom burden and improve treatment tolerability. Dr. Geralt, we are so honored to have you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Jen, and welcome to all everybody who's having lunch and is ready to learn. Uh, Jen, you tell me when I can begin. I'd say go for it, Dr. Gerald. 
Thank you very much, and thanks NBMT Link for hosting me and all of you for coming to this Lunch and Learn. Over the next 20 or 25 minutes, I hope to be able to give you a whirlwind journey of stem cell transplantation. I recognize that many of you are either pre-transplant and a large proportion of you have already gone through the procedure. And I hope over the next 20 or 25 minutes, I can give you information that will help you understand where we came from, where we're going, and particularly if you are in the pre-transplant journey to try to make this easier for you. First, a little bit of history. Stem cell transplantation is one of the first successful immunotherapy and cellular immunotherapy. It actually began in the 1950s, when after the Russians got the bomb, the Department of Defense in the United States tried to find ways of defending populations against the high doses of radiation. Dr. E. Don Thomas, who won the Nobel Prize for his works in bone marrow transplantation, suddenly realized the potential benefits that high doses of radiation could actually have for patients with acute leukemia because patients exposed to high doses of radiation had a total elimination of their normal bone marrow, and many of them would go on to die from, you know, with zero counts. So Dr. Thomas and other investigators, such as George Maté in France, said, well, if we have a patient with acute leukemia and we could give him high doses of radiation and replace the sick marrow with the marrow of somebody else, we would be able to potentially cure these people. And remember, in the 1950s, the big problem was we had all these children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia for which there was really no good treatments. The first transplants were actually performed in 1950, but the first 400 patients, only four survived because there was a lot of things that we didn't know. And actually, Dr. Thomas went on for two years, and all he did was animal studies until he figured out how he could do transplants safely. In 1970, he reported the first 100 patients with acute leukemia who actually were cured from their disease with a bone marrow transplant from a brother who was a tissue matched. At that before, we, before that, we didn't know anything about HLA typing. We didn't know anything about tissue typing. So interestingly enough, in that 1970 report, the oldest patient was 35 years of age. So fast forward from 1970 to, to now, a lot of things have happened. One, we recognize that high-dose therapy, a transplant does not only work because of the high doses of chemotherapy and radiation, but it's particularly when we do a donor transplant, meaning cells that are coming from somebody else, we also exploit a graft versus tumor effect. We get the donor immune system to recognize the patient's malignancy or blood cancer and prevent it from coming back. We recognize that there are two types of transplants depending on where the, where the cells come from. So an allogeneic transplant, the cells come from a third party. Initially, the only donors available were a brother or sister who was a full match. We have what's called HLA proteins. Each of us have 10 or 12 HLA proteins that half of them come from my father and half of them come from, your, uh, from, the, from the mother. If your brother or sister happens to inherit those same types, you have a match within the family. And the chances of any of your brothers or sisters to be in a full match is one out of four. So the larger the family, the more likely you are of having a donor within the family. Now, things have changed a lot in the United States. Families have become smaller, and the chance of finding a donor within your family reduces significantly. Because of that, work done you know, by Dr. John Hansen, who recently, unfortunately, passed away, and other pioneers in the field, such as Richard O'Reilly, we, they, they demonstrated that it would be possible if we created a large registry of volunteer donors that if you didn't have a donor within the family, you would be able to find a match in this large registry donor, and that's called a match unrelated donor. More recently, the teams at Hopkins developed the strategy that you could even do mismatch related donors using a drug called cyclophosphamide. So in 2019, everybody should have a match. The other type of transplant is an autologous transplant. That's where the patient serves as their own donor. In this type of transplant, what basically you want to do is to be able to give high doses of chemotherapy and be able to reduce the disease to its minimal expression. To be able to support the high doses of chemotherapy, 
you have to be able to give stem cells back. The stem cells from the patient are harvested either through the bone marrow or the peripheral blood more commonly, and they are stored in the freezer. We're doing transplants for literally, you know, multiple blood cancers in thousands of patients every year. The most common indication for autologous transplant is multiple myeloma. The most common indication for an allogeneic transplant is acute myelogenous leukemia and MDS. In general, through, when you go through the transplant journey, you go through various phases. The first phase is actually you have to be referred to a transplant center. Not every hematologist, oncologist are actually certified to do transplants. These are people who have extra training. They usually have to be in special centers that are fact, that's foundation for accreditation of cellular therapy, which means that they, you, that they have a minimum set of criteria to be able to consider themselves as transplant centers. One of them is that people have gone through special training in transplant, and they have nurses, social workers, and a whole set of personnel who are trained in taking care of transplant patients. When referred to the transplant center, the transplant physician and his team will do a whole set of evaluations to see, one, are you a transplant candidate? And two, what's the best type of transplant strategy for you? We used to get chemotherapy. Should you get radiation? Should you get high-dose therapy? Should you get low-dose therapy? Should you get an autologous transplant? Should you get an allogeneic transplant? And what type of donor you should get? Regardless whether you get an autologous transplant or an allogeneic transplant, the transplant journey is similar for all patients, and we divide it in five phases. The first phase is the chemotherapy or the preparative regimen phase. These are the combinations of chemotherapy with or without radiation, which has two purposes. One, get rid of the blood cancer, and two, open space for the cells, particularly in the case of a donor transplant. The high doses of chemotherapy and radiation are associated with side effects, but centers are more and more very comfortable and very good in preventing what is known as the nausea, the vomiting, the gastrointestinal side effects. We're trying to get even better because one of the things we're moving into the future is doing personalized drug dosing. There's a drug called busulfan that we now give people a test dose and the final dose is given to be in an exact range. And we're planning to do that with other drugs. There are other supportive care strategies that are aimed at reducing all the side effects from transplant or many of the side effects from transplant. The transplant is a blood transfusion. The cells are infused through a central line. They know where to go. The second phase of the transplant is what we call the low count phase or the cytopenic phase. With the high doses of chemotherapy and radiation, the patient's bone marrow goes down to zero. And the cells of the donor or the cells of the patient take anywhere between 10 to 20 days to recover to regular normal levels. During those 10 or 20 days, patients usually feel tired. They require transfusions. They require sometimes intravenous nutrition and hydration. And more importantly, they require careful observation in case of any infection so a more intense antibiotic treatment can be given. The third phase, what we call early recovery, is a transition phase. Patients are going from daily visits or by seeing daily by the transplant team to two to three weeks as their to two to three times a week as their counts recover. The fourth phase is what we call early convalescence. The immune systems of the patients are weak, and therefore they need to be continuously monitored in case infections come around. In the case of a donor transplant, we need to be training the donor cells to live in the patient's body without causing what we call graft-versus-host disease. A variety of medications exist to prevent graft-versus-host disease, and newer medications are coming out. They're even more effective in the prevention of graft-versus-host disease. The final part of the journey is what we call late convalescence, which happens usually after the first year when the patient's immune system is strong enough that we revaccinate them. We give them all the baby shots they had received before to guarantee that the immunity they had against these preventable infections would um, be maintained. This is an important part and is the part where patients need to take ownership of their own health care. Survivorship care is essential for a long-term healthy living. Their most large transplant center have survivorship clinics, which we think are essential for the good care of the transplant patient. Remember, we didn't make you Superman. We made you human again, and we cured your blood cancer. What's essential? Essential is 
good healthy living, good nutrition, maintain a good activity and exercise level. If you smoke, stop smoking. And then very careful surveillance for cardiovascular disease, keep your blood pressure under control, cholesterol under control, and very careful surveillance for uh, other malignancies, colonoscopies when you need them, chest x-rays when you need them, and particularly total skin exams and oral exams. Results from transplants have improved dramatically over the last couple of years. Our chances of having serious life-threatening complications have gone down to less than 15%. Because of reduced intensity conditioning regimens and because of improvements in supportive care, we now transplant patients routinely up to the age of 80 for an autologous transplant and up to the age of 75 for a donor and allogeneic transplant. Unfortunately, I can't say we cure everybody. Disease recurrence remains the single most important cause of treatment failure. So many of us now are exploring post-transplant therapies, therapies that we can use to reduce the risk of the disease coming back. In myeloma, for example, lenalidomide can double the transplant remission duration by preventing disease recurrence. In acute leukemia, the use of FLT3 inhibitors, such as midostarin and other drugs, also reduces the risk of relapse. Thus, you can see that with the current research that we're doing, we are really trying to improve transplant outcomes that most patients will be able to have long-term disease control. Of interest is that now we have also found ways of targeting or of um, making the immune system attack specific targets on the leukemia cells or on the lymphoma cells. And what we do is actually science fiction almost. So investigators started many years ago and primarily over the last 10 years, pioneered by Dr. Michelle Sadelin here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Uh, Stan Riddell at the University of Washington and other investigators showed that you could get a T-cell, genetically modify it, so that it would recognize a specific target on a cancer cell. Now, the targets have to be very precise. It has to be a molecule that is present primarily on the cancer cell and not on normal tissue, because if you genetically modify the T-cell to attack that target, it's not going to know whether cell, the cell with the target is a cancer cell or not. There is a molecule called CD19, which is primarily expressed on acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells and on lymphocytes. This is an ideal target because it's expressed in no other places in the organism, and it is commonly expressed on acute lymphoblastic leukemia and lymphoma. So investigators both here and uh, Dr. Jim Kohendorfer in the National Cancer Institute and Dr. Carl June develop these CAR T cells, and they're called CAR T cells for chimeric antigen receptor. Essentially what they do is they change the T cell receptor to become more like a B cell receptor to attack a specific protein, a specific target. The first one they looked at was CD19, and there's now two commercial products out there. One is called Kimraya, which is made by Novartis, which is approved for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in young adults and children, and the other one is and the other indication is for uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The other product is called Yescarta. It's made by Kite Gilead. Now, these are autologous products. The donor serves as their own source of cells. These cells are sent to either Novartis or, yes, or Kite. They genetically modify the cells, and then they give it back to the center to be infused. There are literally dozens of other investigational products out there looking at different targets. The one that we think will be coming... Most commonly to us is a, um, a product attacking BCMA, which is a target that is explicitly, expressively present in myeloma patients. And the interesting things about these CAR T cells is that they're extremely effective, response rates of 60 to 80 percent, but they're also associated with side effects, something that's called the cytokine release syndrome, in which patients have very high fevers or neurotoxicities when patients become very subtended and can go into coma. These toxicities, although severe and sound serious, they are also reversible with treatment like tocilizumab and um, steroids. We, um, we think this is the dawn of a new era. 
many of these treatments have been successful in treating patients who've relapsed post-transplant. So they give us a second chance, and they've been very effective to be, be a bridge to transplant. And I think I'd like Jen to introduce our next speaker, who's going to tell us how these treatments, or to just give us an example of how these treatments can be changing. Jen? Thank you so much, Dr. Jarrell. Thank you for all of that information. It's such an honor to have you. And another honor of ours is uh, J.C. Walsh. She is just a ray of sunshine, in my opinion. Uh, she is 42 years old and lives in Chicago, Illinois, with her husband and two daughters, age 8 and 11. And she was a healthy young mother working in the pharmaceutical industry when she was diagnosed in April 2013 with acute lymphoblastic le uh, leukemia. At that time, she was treated at Northwestern Memorial with a new protocol for young adults and adolescents with untreated ALL. She was in remission soon after beginning the protocol with no minimal residual disease. She completed the course of therapy in July 2015 and remained in remission until November 2016. At that point, she was treated again with chemo and underwent a double cord transplant in February 2017. She was again leukemia-free until February 2018. She began a course of a new drug, Inotuzumab, and was again in remission for one year. In March 2019, she was accepted into a clinical trial for young adults and adolescents with relapsed ALL for CAR-T cell therapy at the University of Chicago. She received CAR-T in April 2019 and remains in remission today, and we are just so thankful that Immerman's Angels uh, led you to us, and we cannot wait to have you share your story with others. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so as Jennifer said, in March, I was accepted into the KITE clinical trial for CART-T cell therapy at the University of Chicago for wow. young adults. Um, one of the biggest things in, that made me a good candidate for this trial was the fact that I was young, a young adult who had relapsed disease um, and failed two traditional therapies. So that includes chemotherapy, that includes stem cell transplant, uh, that includes new targeted chemotherapy drugs. Um, and I was also in good health otherwise. So I didn't have any other issues that would preclude me from receiving the trial. In March, uh, on March 7th of 2019, they collected the T cells for the CART T therapy and they were removed via apheresis and they were sent off to California to basically be re-engineered and as we called them, uh, go to T-cell boot camp. Uh, and at that point, um, the next day I received bridging chemotherapy to reduce the disease burden. And on March 25th, I began a five-day chemotherapy regimen. So this was more of a minimal um, chemotherapy regimen basically to make room for those cells to come in and have a place to then regenerate and repopulate. Um, I received the cells um, on April 4th. I was supposed to receive them on April 1st. However, on March 30th, I developed a neutropenic fever and we had to push back the infusion uh, for 72 hours. Um, so the infusion of T cells is very anticlimactic, similar to a stem cell transplant. It's a blood infusion um, and nothing really happens much the few days afterwards. Uh, you're hospitalized for approximately 30 to 45 days, depending on count recovery and certainly any side effects that may occur. Um, during that time, I received an anaphylactic drug regimen and anti-seizure medication to make sure that we eliminated as much of the side effects as we possibly could. Um, about 10 to 12 days post-infusion, the CRP levels skyrocketed and I came down with a very high fever of 104 and rising uh, that was uncontrollable with Tylenol or any type of fever control medication. Um, at that point, I was given tocilizumab, and a low-grade fever followed for about three or four days, 
and I had slight um, neurological effects, confusion, and, and some sh- some shuffling. Um, but those resolved within a few days, and quite frankly, it was difficult to determine whether the uh, neurological issues were resultant of the high fever or resultant of uh, these the transplant. Um, so some of the things that I did in terms of success and that helped me to get through the process and, and I think made my situation a bit more successful was that I, in the hospital, I continued to walk every day. Um, I made sure that I asked a lot of questions to the doctors and nursing staff, and they were the, really the only ones that I had as a resource to what was going to happen to me, what they were going to do to handle those situations that were going to happen to me, what I could expect from this, what we were looking for in terms of neurological side effects. Um, And then certainly the support of friends and family was significant as well, uh, especially given the fact that I have young children at home. Uh, Long-term for CAR-T fatigue certainly is a factor as counts recover as well as long-term uh, low counts for probably about three months um, it took for counts to recover. Some moderate hair loss, that just varies depending on the person. And certainly anxiety over cancer returning is definitely something that I struggle with on a regular basis um, and certainly have support with through family as well as a, a therapist that helps me through all of that as well as my doctors and, and nurses and all of that. So that's pretty much my journey with stem cell and um, with CAR T cell therapy. And I am currently, as of yesterday, when I visited Dr. Stock again, um, am in remission and doing well and have full count recovery. And we will be six months um, come October. So thank you so much for sharing with us, JC, and congratulations on a wonderful doctor's appointment yesterday. I'm sure your family was dancing with you. (laughs) All right, Erin, if you could please inform our callers how they can ask questions today, because I am sure we probably have many for these two. Yes, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, ladies and gentlemen, that is star 1 for your questions at this time. Star 1, we'll pause for just a moment. We do have a question in queue. We'll take our first one. Caller, please go ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Ed Spazello. I have uh, CLL, and I've had for 31 years. I've relapsed several times, had several treatments, including a stem cell transplant. I'm now on Venclexta. And my question is, is there any progress in getting CTEL cell therapy for CLL patients? I'm also 78 years old. So thank you very much for that question. And again, guidance for everybody on the sign. Uh, I cannot answer specific questions on your specific conditions because I'm not your physician, but I can answer generalities. And this is a perfect example of the question is, will there be advances in T-cell therapy for CLL? The answer is yes. There are various products out there in advanced phase. These are, again, Um, CAR T-cells, like the one that JC got, targeting a CD19 target and other targets that are being developed specifically for CLL. Actually, some of the first CAR T-cell successes were in patients with CLL done in the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. David Porter. But most of the protocols now will require you to be failing your current therapy So if the current therapy is working, there really is no need to explore CAR T-cells, but there will be CAR T-cell protocols for CLL patients available. Up to now, there has been no exclusion for age, but it's basically they exclude depending on your condition and other comorbidities. Thank you. Can we have our next call, please? Yes, ma'am. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Judy. I live in North Carolina, and um, I have been diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma three times. Uh, The first time was back in 2015, and I had just um, 
chop and radiation. Um, the cancer returned within less than a year, and at that point we did um, our ice and the beam, and then I had the stem cell transplant with my own stem cells. And then just recently, earlier this year, um, I had CAR T therapy as well as um, like JC was describing. And so I just had my six month um, post CAR T anniversary at the beginning of September. So far, I am still in remission. I'm still experiencing um, some low counts. Uh, my immunoglobulin does not seem to want to <laughs> come back. I've had um, I've had four IVIGs already. I have another one scheduled for um, next Tuesday, the 24th. Um, but my oncologist is encouraged that my regular counts, my neutrophil, white counts, my hemoglobin are rising, but the immunoglobulin doesn't seem to come up to where it needs to be. And so I was just curious if anybody else has been experiencing that. Um, it's it's just it's been a very rough journey with the CAR T for me. And um I'm I'm finally at the point where I do feel kind of normal, but um just the anxiety perhaps coming back and my and my cell still being low. Uh so Judy Great uh, comments and questions. Again, rapidly, I can go to in general. A, low counts post-CAR T-cell has been, although rare, a not infrequent phenomena, particularly because, as you can see, you've had a lot of treatment, you had a transplant. Uh, they generally recover over time. The low immune globulin levels is expected because the CAR T-cells will affect the normal plasma cells, and in a certain sense, it may mean that your CAR T-cells are still there. We are recommending that people get gamma globulin replacement once a month until the gamma globulins return to normal. Talk to your physician about whether you should be getting other prophylactic antibiotics for either shingles or for other issues. If the counts remain low, and I mean, patients whose counts are very low requiring continuous growth factors or in, you know, if they're, the platelets are requiring transfusions, on occasions, patients have had still prior cells stored from their prior autologous transplant. It's worthwhile asking mm -hmm. if you do, because then you could get a stem cell boost. Okay, thank you. Just to jump onto that, I have had um, IVIG treatments as well, and um, my counts, although almost fully recovered, are still on the lower side of normal, and um, I do have counts that are uh, very on the low side of normal. So um, it does, it definitely, I think, is different for each patient and does take some time as you're experiencing. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Can we have our next question? Hi, this is Jackie calling from Baltimore. And I just wanted to ask um, what would be the steps, next steps for a patient uh, with multiple myeloma to present prevent the return of the disease or attempt to? So uh, that really depends on depends on where we are, with where a patient is in their myeloma journey. So generally speaking, upfront therapy for myeloma is induction with a three drug regimen consolidation with high-dose melphalan, and then maintenance with lenalidomide until the disease comes back. When the disease comes back, patients usually get reinduced, and then depending on the treatment they've received, a decision will be made whether they will be on continued treatment with some form of drug that got them in remission, or whether all treatment will be stopped and we will wait until the disease comes back. More and more, we are now giving continued treatment to patients. So let's say if you were on daratumumab, Darzalex, that got you back in remission, we would keep you on Dara once a month until the disease came back. Many patients are being offered investigational trials to try to prevent relapse from happening, and uh, that is always a good option. But in general, it depends on each individual's patient circumstances 
what type of strategy will be given to them to try to increase the duration of their remission. Sometimes the strategy may be a cellular therapy, such as a donor transplant or an autologous transplant. And uh, also, can you tell me the um, percentage of people who do not go into remission? So it depends on the stage. Usually with primary therapy, 90% of the people go into remission and 40% of the people go into a complete remission. Okay, thank you so much. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Mike from Indiana, and our 23-year-old son had CAR T. Uh, we're on day 35. Uh, it went very well, uh, no side effects, and uh, he was out of the hospital at day 15. Uh, my question is, uh, assuming that this is successful for him in the near term, will he have uh, restrictions on you know, activity and lifestyle uh, going forward, uh, or will he be able to basically uh, return to normal activity? Mike, thank you very much for that question, and we're hoping that everything goes well with your son. Um, in general, I can tell you each institution has different requirements and requests about lifestyle changes, particularly early on because the immune system is still weak. There still is some degree of limitations, of ex particularly when you have to expose yourself to large crowds. I think that is a great question to ask your care team, what the short-term and mid-term restrictions should be and what type of uh, lifestyle modifications the family and your son should have to try to minimize the risk of uh, complications, particularly infectious complications. Yeah, to jump on that, I stayed out of anywhere that had groups of people, um, grocery stores, um, stores in general, uh, church, anywhere that was had large groups of people for quite a while until my counts recovered to a level that was no longer dangerous. And again, that's going to depend on your care team, certainly. Um, but I would say by this point, um, given the fact that my counts are relatively normal, I have returned to most of the things that I would do in everyday life. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm from New Jersey. I had CAR T cell done in March after learning that my uh, uh, heavy progressive McGrath treatment did not work. It was a relapse, so I was on a randomized study. It's the Zuma 7 for ref relapse refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, I also had this weird thing due to I had a tumor in my neck, which pinched a nerve which led to paralyzed vocal cords, and that's a, a situation I'm still dealing with. So my question is, I had a similar experience, and thanks to the doctor and JC for, for their comments, they're excellent. Um, similar CAR T cell experience, fascinating in a weird way. About two weeks, I had a high 105 fever. I had the, uh, the symptoms JC talked about, came out after two weeks, and then six weeks no driving, but then I started getting back, back into work and life pretty normally. Um, my big concern is, well, you know, what's life now? We've touched on that. Um, I'm going for blood work this afternoon because I felt a little run down. I feel a little breathless. And, again, I could be it's hard to know what it's from. Is it from the vocal cords, the CAR T, the chemo? Um, these are all things I call layers. So it's just good to hear from different people about how things progress. You know, I wonder how long the cells are in me. I call myself a genetically modified organism. You know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, what to expect down the road. Thank you. So, Mike, thank you very much. And again, I mean, specific for your situation, I can only tell you in general, um, you know, yes, you should be connecting with your doctors. Remember that, you know, over around the world, less than a 1,000 people have received CAR T cells. So there are side late side effects that we might not yet recognize. Uh, particularly you're still early in the course, so infection is an important consideration. So a full workup should be done. Um, you, we are, um, you know, we're, you know, the one thing that I think is important is that we've seen that a lot of the remissions are now being durable. They've gone more than one in two years. So, and this is in constants when we can't see the CAR T cells. So 
I mean, I think we're cautiously optimistic that a fraction of patients like you and JC may have very long-term disease control and hopefully can go on to live a very, 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 very long life without having to deal with lymphoma again. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Linda Tremaine from Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm calling uh, on behalf of my husband, who has multiple myeloma, <clears throat> was diagnosed in February of 2013, went through a transplant in August of 2013, relapsed in 2017, went through a second transplant in June of 2018. So he's just passed the one-year mark, is in remission. <clears throat> His counts are great. Um the doctors wanted to put him on Kyprolis after the second transplant, which Medicare would not approve, and put him on Pomalist instead. Um, he's not been able to tolerate Pomalist. Uh, any of the side effects that are listed, he pretty much had. So they've taken him off of it, and he's not on any maintenance. He's only taking the dexamethasone. I was just wondering what the progress is on the trials for the CAR-T for multiple myeloma patients. So we're glad your husband's doing very well, and thank you for the question, Linda. So currently there are a variety of protocols for myeloma for CAR-T, all of them in patients who are failing prior therapy. There are protocols being planned as consolidation therapy, some of them in the context of transplant, some of them instead of transplant. But these are for people early in the course of the disease and they still have not yet opened. But I would suggest that you talk to your uh, primary doctor just so that he's aware, he finds out what CAR-T protocols are close to you so you can be on their radar screen. Okay. Okay, because I know that um, when it comes back again, it's going to come back sooner since he is not on anything. Correct. Is but, that... I mean, and the other thing is I think you should um, either con contact Amgen and see if the, there is a financial assistance program or is there a program that may help you revert the decision from Medicare. Gotcha. Okay, that's Amgen. Amgen, no, you may, they're the they're the pharmaceutical company that manufactures Kyprolis. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you very much for the information. Mm -hmm. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Um, um, I'm Dr. Mara, and I was wondering about the progressing of uh, new new approach. Will ever be trying to CML? I have a daughter who has CML and has a lot of AEs. So, Doctor, that's an excellent question and one which, you know, the question is, will transplant become so easy and safe that patients with CML should decide just to go to transplant instead of going on the TKIs for the rest of their life? We're not there yet, um, although transplant is very effective in patients who... Um, have been not able to tolerate TKIs. At this time, we're still, uh, you know, advising obviously that, you know, first order of business is try the TKIs. If they can't take that, then, uh, could, you know, you should be, you know, you should probably be, have a transplant consultation. Thank you. I'll take our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Ralph Barnett. I'm uh, 69 in October. And by the way, doctor, I'm friends with Brian Drury, he's a neighbor and a good friend of mine. And he was, uh, was going to recommend that I uh, come and see you, but he uh, says to say hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm here, I'm here. Um, okay. Uh, I have... Um, I'm now on a on a list for a transfusion. I mean, um, uh, I'm not. Uh, I hear everybody else's situation. 
don't quite understand it because I'm uh, I have for the last 20, 25 years at a high white count, and they, we controlled that. But now my hemoglobin um, uh, always was an average of around uh, eight nines, uh, nines, and I did have a transfusion two years ago, and kept, and it always kept at that level. I do jackafee at uh, half a. Uh, ten, uh, ten in the morning and ten at night, and a and a Procrit exam, uh, Procrit injection. But now my hemoglobin um, has dropped to like a five, five eight, five five two. I've had transfusions, but it seems <clears throat> that my, um, according to Brian and um, and also my oncologist, my spleen seems to um, be eating up. My my red my blood, but I do not. I've had a bone marrow biopsy, and I don't have leukemia in my bone marrow. But everybody, um, my oncologist and uh, at the uh, Dr. Paquette at Cedar Sinai, think my alternative is uh, to do a bone marrow transplant. So I am on a list, but I just. Uh, before that happens, is there any other? Uh, Brian maybe suggested taking the spleen out, but my doctor said my liver was a little um, high, so not to take the spleen out because that could disturb the liver. So, so again, I'm not and I'm, I'm, I'm so again specifics I can't go into. I do I can tell you look. For patients who have had myeloproliferative disorders and in whom traditional therapies are not working, it does make a lot of sense to consider a donor transplant. We do routinely do donor transplants in patients up to the age of 75. Um, in California and in LA, you have very good transplant programs, both at Sinai at um, and uh, you know at uh, so I think. It is worthwhile to have a conversation with the transplant program there and make a decision of, and with your doctor to make a decision of what the next best step is. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. We'll take our next caller. And you please go ahead. Oh, yes. My name is Scott Barrett, and I was diagnosed uh, March uh, of 2019. Uh, my question, though, is uh, when will it, how will the recording of this uh, uh, be re available? Uh, we should have it on our website within a week, um, and uh, we'll also be sending out notes from the call in about a week as well. Okay, I was. Uh, will it go out? Uh, I was notified of this uh, by email, so would it go also go out by email, possibly? Uh, if you go on to the mbmtlink.org, our website, and under our uh -huh. Lunch and Learn tab, you'll be able to access this recording as well as all of our other Lunch and Learns. Thank you so much. Oh, you are so welcome. We'll go to our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Call your line is open. Please check your mute function. All right. Hi. My name is Heidi. I wanted to know if the side effects from the CAR T were worse than what you thought for JC that had it already. Were they worse or were they better than what you thought? Because I already had my cells taken out of me. Okay. And um, I'm going to have to have them put back in, but um, I'm wondering, I'm scared about all the side effects. So... I was very in fear of the side effects as well, I think, because there's just not a lot of information. Um, and, and as Dr. Geralt said, there's not a lot of patients who have received CART T cell as a whole, whereas um, with stem cell treatment um, or stem cell replacement, they there are many, many patients over many, many years that have received the treatment. So I was, I like you, was very scared of the side effects that would come. Um, for me, I think the side effects were less uh, less than what I anticipated them being and less scary than what I anticipated them being. But that said, right. I do know that 
you know, every patient and how they respond to things is, is very different. I also had it very built up in my mind going into it that it would be horrible. So, um, I, you know, I think it's all perspective. And, uh, you know, again, I think every patient is different. But I, for me, I think they were a little less than what I anticipated going into it. And I remind that they are reversible. So it is, yeah. I mean, thank God it's very, 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 very few patients who have serious life-threatening, unreversible toxicities, and uh, therefore, again, and, you know, this really begin. It, this is life-saving treatment. Right, right. And everything okay, was I'm going to do it. through different drugs and, and, you know, different things, at, at least in, in my case. So um, right, we right. seem to manage everything. But you were in good health except for having cancer. You were in good health otherwise, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, me too. Me too, except my voice. <laughs> but that other man well, said luck. something about his voice. So thank you so much for the information. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck to you too. Good luck. Okay. We'll take our next call in queue. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Brenda from Dallas. And I'm calling because um, I have cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Do you know of any cases where it has progressed to need a transplant? And if so, what type? Um, so in general, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is treated either with local treatment, such as electron beam radiation or some systemic treatment. Depending on some of the characteristics and on the behavior, patients have undergone either an autologous transplant or a donor transplant. Okay, thank you. We'll take our next caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Chris from Tampa, Florida. Uh, my daughter was uh, treated for AML leukemia. Uh, November of last year. She's currently in remission. And my question is, is there a CAR-T therapy for AML? So that is a great question. There are many investigators across the country looking for CAR-T cells for AML. One of the problems is identifying the target, but there are uh, there are protocols out there. One, CD123 is a target. Um, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you can do a search for CAR-T for, leuke- for acute myeloid leukemia, and you'll get a list of open studies. Thank you. Okay, Aaron, I think we can take one more question. At this time, there are no further questions in queue, ma'am. Wow, okay. We got some right great Right on time. Interest. Wow, that was perfect. Um, First of all, I just want to thank everyone that joined us today, and I I certainly wish everyone the best with their health moving forward. Uh, I want to let you know, again, this will be on our website in about a week. You'll get some notes as well. You'll also get a survey today. If anyone's interested in joining us next month, we'll have physician assistant Jean Garrity uh, teaching us on the benefits of mindfulness, and will walk us through an exercise, as well as we'll have survivor Peter Thomason share how mindfulness helped him on his journey with his transplant. If you would like further information about survivorship issues or supports available, please feel free to contact us at the link at 1-800-L-I-N-K-B-M-T. We're also looking to expand our peer mentors for those that are calling um, to speak to someone who's been through something they've gone through. Uh, We actually did need to turn to Immerman's Angels to get someone that has had a CAR-T cell therapy just because there are so few of you. So um, if you are interested in helping someone else through this, please reach out. But again, thank you all. Thank you to our speakers, and we wish everyone a great day.